Hello, and welcome to Partial Redacted, a podcast where we discuss privacy and security engineering related topics. I'm your host, Sean Faulkner, and today I'm joined by Dave Erickson, co founder of Found, and we'll be talking about battling telecommunications fraud. Dave, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for having me, Sean. This is great. Yeah, thanks for being here. Maybe we can start off with the introduction. You know, who are you? What do you do? Um, so I'm Dave Erickson. I'm um, uh, probably the most notable thing is I was the founder of freeconferencecall.com about 24 years ago or something like that. Um, free conference call, fortunate for me, grew to become the largest audio conferencing company in minute volume in the world at one point. And um, that endeavor allowed me to kind of chase in that journey and build out a global phone infrastructure um, and carrier network. And so we have three carriers in the United States. We have a wireless carrier, a CELIC carrier, and IPES carrier, which is a like a voice over IP, and a lot of numbering resources and those kinds of things. Awesome. And then... What sort of, how did you go from there to now the, essentially your new, newer project found? Well, so, you know, being in this industry, it's a, it's a wonderful industry. I'm, I'm completely fascinated with it. Um, being in it as long as I have, you, you start to see that, um, there's gaps in the system and it's, 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 it's actually broken, right? Like the voice system was created um, in Alexander Graham Bell's time and the quality hasn't gotten better and really the security hasn't gotten better and stuff like SMS has kind of followed the same path as, as, as voice. Um, and so you see, you know, problems all over when you're in this business and, and found as a way of trying to true those problems, correct those problems, get rid of some of the problems that we have on, on the current communication networks. Yeah, excellent. Uh, you know, I, I'm pretty excited about this topic because actually a few of the products I worked on during my time at Google were actually focused on trying to improve the security of SMS calls and even evolve the carrier messaging protocol to a more secure system. So this is a topic I have some you know personal familiarity with. And maybe we could start with SMS. So SMS has now you know been around uh, for you know a couple of decades, but it's inherently insecure and fraud's a significant concern. What makes the SMS protocol particularly insecure and such a popular target for scams? Well, so, you know, the beauty of, of like the public switch telephone network and SMS and even like conferencing, for example, um, they're all easily accessible, right? Um, when I get a phone number from a carrier, I think, hey, um, the reason I'm getting this is so that people can call me so that I can be contacted. Um, and then after that comes the, the thought of security, privacy, unwanted calls, and all those kinds of things. But SMS, voice, and conferencing are all meant to be accessed. So you kind of go down this path. If I make it highly accessible, how do I keep out unwanted activity? And it's, it's, it's difficult. And do you think also, you know, a lot of these things, as you mentioned, they've been around for a long time. So they weren't necessarily thinking about the scale of potential problems that arise today in a you know fully connected world where um uh, and where a lot of people you know a lot of these systems are running you know perhaps in in a, a different way than they were when they were first designed does that essentially like escalate the potential for scams and the, the scale of those types of scams yeah so what's happened i think is you know we had this system that was designed a long time ago it was, it was doing great. Occasionally you'd get a cold call. Some guy would call you, um, you know, and bug you and you'd have to hang up on them or something. Now what's happened is, is that the advancements in technology have far outpaced the ability for the PSTN or SMS to add in any kind of security or provide privacy to, to match what, you know, robocalling machines, you know, there's, they can make 5 million calls a day. Um, it's the same with, with SMS, right? You can, there's, there's no protection for the consumer in, in, in these products. AI is coming in now. And I think AI is just going to really complicate the problem. And then, you know, you've got technology that that's now allowing for like deep fakes and things like that. And so it's, it's, it's getting worse and it's not, it has very few chances of getting better with, 
that dated of technology. Yeah, you mentioned deep fakes. I know, um, I think I probably mentioned this on the show in, at some point in the past, but there was a retool, uh, you know, hack and data breach that happened last year where the attacker actually used deep fake voice as part of that scam that they were running. And it basically impersonated someone who was an actual employee of retool in order to kind of like fake out some of the folks that were working on the customer support side. Yeah, it's literally like technology that we used to see on like Mission Impossible, right, is now in the hands of, you know, our our, our favorite Nigerian prince. <laughs> yes. <laughs> What what are some of the like common methods besides things like you know we mentioned deface, which is kind of like a newer a newer way of um, you know scamming people? But historically, what are some of the ways that people disguise their identity when sending SMS messages or making phone calls? Like, and are there ways of actually detecting those methods? It's 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 very difficult. You start skating the um, the area of of listening in on calls and and taking privacy in another way, right? So if a vent, if, if, a, if a service provider tries to listen in and, and, and uh, stop things, then it's, it's, it's a different kind of breach of privacy is, is the way I see it. Um, so there's like only so much that can be done kind of around the content of a call or the content of the SMS. And then you're kind of, breaching the, the, the same issues, right? Um, there's a lot of like dipping that happens on the PSDN for like, you know, companies like Nomo Robo or Umail that are able to kind of do a honeypot of numbers and find out, you know, who the scammers are and then start blocking the numbers from there, but then they just get new numbers. Um, and so that's, it's, it's, it's not a solution. It's, uh, ongoing battle. Are we getting better at uh, any of this or is it actually getting worse? I think, you know, we've gone probably about as far as we can go with the sort of public systems. I think that it takes kind of a redesigning of, of believe it or not, like contacts and how contacts are done. If we want to add more privacy, more intimacy, and and kind of put up guard in the public space. You know, for the people who are, you know, running some of these scams through, say, SMS, you know, what are the like techniques that they're actually using to impersonate individuals, like or individual businesses? So, you know, these guys are smart and they operate on human psychology and and they they either work on one of two things. They work on fear or they work on greed. So they reach out to you with a text that is something that you feel you need to do immediately because it's an emergency and you're afraid of, or they reach out to you with a text that's like, Hey, this is, um, price, uh, it's not price waterhouse. Who was the guys that used to give away all the money? Um, Oh, um, Publishers clearing yes, house. Yes, publishers clearing house. <laughs> Not Price Waterhouse. <laughs> um, publishers clearing house, and and um, you know, so the the guy gets a text. He's he's uh, like everybody else. He's he's making ends meet, and all of a sudden he thinks that you know there might be some potential that he's getting reached out to because he's you know won a million dollars a year for the rest of his life or 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 something. And so his greed kicks in. And it's like, he really wants it to be real. Right. Um, and I think that's where they, where they get, get people. And, and really, I think the biggest thing that's changed in this, that's made it so, so bad is that these guys can just do huge amounts of numbers. Right. And so, um, you know, in the old days, you're cold calling, it's like a cold caller could make maybe, you know, if he was busy a, a couple hundred calls in a day. Um, a machine can make a lot more. They can send a lot more texts and they're not looking for, um, the smart guys like yourself that are, that are into this and know what's going on and know how they're, they're, they're looking for the most vulnerable of our population. Right. And, and there is some things we can do in that kind of fringe of the most vulnerable, like, you know, I think elderly people should have their phones completely locked down. Like it's hard to lock down my SMS because I'm going to want to sign up for open table or, 
you know, some, some service that requires my SMS to be open. But I think, um, you know, if it comes to your parents or something like that, it's like, it's, you know, there's, there's ways to like really dial it down, um, because they're not doing all of the kind of fresh activity that requires impromptu SMS. Are these, you know, these types of attacks, are they targeted or is it, they're just kind of blanket, you know, sending these out to lots and lots of different people, kind of like spam and hoping that they hit a population that takes a bite. Yeah, that's exactly it. It's a big, huge numbers game. And and I received, you know, SMS on different numbers that I have. And, um, you know, I, I always kind of play around with them a little bit just to see what's going on, see if it's a, a complete AI driven thing, or if it's, if it's, you know, humans behind the scene and they say, you know, Oh, you know, Ron, how you doing? And it's like, my name's not Ron. Um, but if you say, Oh, my name's not Ron. then they're like, Oh, who are you? And they try and, you know, start striking up a conversation. Um, but I say something like, Oh, Hey, I just won the lotto, you know? <laughs> and, um, it's interesting to see their reactions it, they, you know, if you do odd things off like that, um, it kind of, kind of tips their pitch a little bit, I think, and they don't know, know what to do really. They're looking for, um, the super vulnerable, they get confused by their messages. And then is there a cost associated with the person who's running these scams to be able to send out these types of messages? There, there is, um, you know, SMS is becoming more and more, uh, uh, competitive and the pricing is commoditizing. Um, we have like two types of pricing. Um, and one is like a registered pricing and one's like an unregistered pricing. Um, there's like the person to person texting and then there's like application to person texting. Um, and these set different levels of, of, of costs. And so, it's interesting because the companies that are trying to be competitive and do good things can get tangled up in this and not have the right thing and pay higher costs. The scammers, the guys in Nigeria, you know, they don't care the cost. They don't care if it's a 10th of a cent or a penny. Um, you know, so like the penalty price is almost 10 times the volume price, but it's in their It, 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 it works in their system. So it doesn't, doesn't affect anybody except for the kind of new startup companies. Um, the the scammers are are fine with that pricing. And then are they using like an SMS aggregator to send these out, or are they going through some sort of like illegit, you know, illegal channel to send the SMS? Um, most like everything I've seen, it's been going through some kind of aggregator, um, and uh, you can imagine all of the SMSs that are going on and. Um, you know, you have these, these groups that, that, you know, maybe there's some kind of travel, uh, cruise line or something like that. And it's, it's, it's really remarkable how many SMS texts one, one customer will, will send like that. Um, and so there, these channels are just really flooded. Right. And so it takes complaining. It takes a lot of things to kind of spot these guys out in SMS. Unfortunately, in SMS, we don't have like the honey pots that collect things and then uh, shut down the SMS just yet. I think we're getting there. Um, but it's, 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 it's issues with just sheer volume, I think. Right. And kind of separating out, you know, what I like to say, separating the pepper from the fly shit. Right. It's like, it's almost impossible to like pick them out on, on, on the, on the fly. You've got to get complaints and, and try and track them down. Yeah, and I guess there's such a volume of SMS, both legitimate and illegitimate, that it's hard to kind of like, you know, separate the two. Because just because you're sending high volume doesn't mean that it's necessarily something like nefarious. You could be sending just like a, a massive amount of two-factor authentication codes or something like that. And this is all being lumped at the aggregator level, which has, they purchase some, you know, bulk discount pricing with the carriers directly. Um, so... It all kind of gets, you know, it's like a melting pot of, of like SMS from both illegal activities and legal activities. Yeah. And I think it's, I think it's, it's in, in SMS is different than, um, than voice voice. 
voice is Title II with the FCC. There's a lot of regulation around voice. There's a lot of a lot of laws around voice, um, and it's it's regulated by the FCC. Where like SMS, not to say that the FCC can't can't regulate it in some way, but it it's mainly regulated by the carriers that are receiving the SMS. So it's AT and T, Verizon, and T Mobile, and um, they've, they've got a problem on their hands. You know, it's, it's, it's very difficult to, to solve what they're trying to solve. And I think if they're, uh, if they become aggressive, right, it, it really starts kind of messing with the public utility of SMS because you get, uh, companies that are getting cut off or getting their SMS blocked by, you know, maybe one carrier, right? If, if T-Mobile starts blocking your text cause they think it's spam, um, you can't rely on your SMS anymore because you don't know how many of your people are on T-Mobile, who's not going to get it. You know, it's, 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 it's a messy situation. And then occasionally I get a text message from, you know, a random phone number where they're impersonating like the CEO of my company trying to get me to like purchase a, a I don't know, like a, a gift certificate at wall, Mark on their behalf or something. So there they're combining <clears throat> some personal information because they know that I work for Skyflow. They know the Skyflow CEO's name. All these things are, of course, publicly available. Are they using something where, you know, it, it feels targeted, but I'm assuming they're doing some sort of automated approach to this where it's still like they're blanking this out to everyone, but they're essentially pulling in data from, you know, sources like LinkedIn or other publicly available sources to personalize it a little bit. Yeah, it's, it's sort of the, um, level of the scammer, right? I think there's your guys that are sending out publishers clearing house, you know, faking, faking an identity or faking to be a company that deals directly with the consumer. And that's one kind of scam. And I think that's very popular. That's very easy to do. Um, the other one, you know, that you're talking about is where they actually study the company a little bit. They, you know, go to a, a LinkedIn site or something and find out who the CFO is, find out who the CEO is, their names, uh, the things they like, uh, and then they look to impersonate it. And this is something that's really, uh, close, close to me because, um, I got taken for a couple hundred thousand dollars by a controller in my company that got these kind of emails where he was receiving an email from supposedly my CFO. And it looked very much like it was the CFO's email, um, the way that it came in. But unless you, you know, drill down and look at the, the email and the, the, correspondence, you're not, you're not going to figure it out. And it was interesting because after he had made the second wire, he felt something was, was wrong and it wasn't in the correspondence. It was in the pressure that they were putting on him. So he made a wire and then they made him like do another wire immediately. And he was like, you know, this is odd. And then when he looked at it, he felt really bad, but, um, it was too late. It was, it was over, right? Like there's no way to get that money back. It gets wired into some account and it goes to China or, you know, someplace. That, and when you talk to the, the, the law enforcement and the authorities about it, um, you can tell that they're pretty, pretty hopeless that you're going to get your money back or that you're going to be able to do anything about it. Yes, a similar, not not quite to the same scale, but a similar issue or scam happened with my wife years ago with uh, on Airbnb. It was kind of a similar situation where she felt like something felt a little off, but she wasn't used to actually renting things on Airbnb. So uh, wasn't 100% familiar with the protocol and just happened, like they basically got lucky that she was someone who hadn't done this before. And then immediately, as soon as she did the payment, she's like, called me and asked me about it because it just felt off. And then of course it was too late and, and there's not really much you can do. But when it comes to these types of things, um, you know, th it seems like sometimes people have this like instinct that something feels a little bit off and maybe they don't pay attention to it at the time. And then they realize it afterwards. But what are some of the things like an individual could actually do to proactively protect themselves from these kinds of scams and falling into these types of traps? Yeah. I think we have to be really mindful. Um, 
that this this environment exists, right? Um, because I think it's 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 a very natural behavior for us to use SMS and then to use our telephone. Um, I think people are way ahead on telephone now, right? Um, you see a number you don't know, you 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 think, oh, this is a cold call, or you get a thing that says likely spam or something like that, and you know your red flags go up and, and, um, you know, you look at it with that, with that kind of view. Um, I think SMS is, uh, taking a, you know, quite a few people by surprise. I think especially like the elderly that, that really don't text all that much, they're receiving a message, um, and they, they, they start acting on it, but it's, it's, um, it's, you know, unfortunately, it's about being diligent these days because we have a, a wide open public utility and the public utility was designed a long time ago. And, um, it's, it's, it's not like we're going to be able to secure it. I don't think we're going to be able to secure it in the current, current design. We would have to, you know, change a little bit of how people, you know, act, you know, consumer behavior, we would have to change consumer behavior. Are there essentially, you know, steps in that direction? Are there, you know, changes that are happening across like privacy and security or even at the like carrier protocol level to make these systems more secure? Um, I mean, I think people are doing things. I think that, um, you know, the current network was meant to be accessible um, what we're doing at Found is an interesting approach to it, and and what we're creating is a self managed contact. And so, Found is the idea that you you take your phone number and you build a self managed contact that people can find. Um, but when you have a a Found phone number and a Found contact, um, you can control who calls by who's in your phone book. You can control. Um, based on different criteria of like a whitelist, a blacklist. Um, you, we, we can do CAPTCHA. We can, there's like a, a number of things that we can do once the user has started a self-managed contact. And the reason the self-managed contact is as important, if you call a found number and I've locked it down, right? It says, you know, this, this person is using found to protect himself. Please go to found and type in his phone number and ask him for permission to call him, ask him for permission to SMS. him. And so it's much like you can't see my Instagram unless you friend me on found. You can't make calls to me unless you friend me. And so it's a way to, to keep, keep people out. Now on the SMS, it's very difficult because if I totally lock out my SMS, um, there's impromptu SMSing that happens that that's part of my monthly activity. You know, when I sign up for things and this and that, and what I recommend in this is that it's, it's, it's important to probably have a couple of numbers, right? A couple of numbers, ones, you know, you communicate with your friends and all the things. And then like, I have a number that I use for all the apps I use for anything that's going to create marketers calling me and, and, deal with that and then, you know, shut that number down when I don't need to hear from it. Right. And I know when I sign up for something, well, then I'll go check that number and fish out that, that thing, but I don't have to like change a bunch of things, turn a bunch of things on and turn them back off again. And so I think the solution is, you know, self-managed contact cards and having multiple numbers. And, and, you know, I've been using that system for a while and it, it, it's definitely much more pleasant and I don't, I don't receive as many unwanted calls. And the, is the idea of the self-managed contact, is it kind of like, um, basically like a registry service for, I can go and sort of register myself as a, as a, as an account. And then additionally, you have the controls where people have to, like you said, the Instagram example, like it, it, people essentially have to friend me. So I have to prove them to make a phone call to, to me. Yeah. The, the, you know, um, I love Apple, I love Android. Um, but the Apple dialer and the Android dialer are archaic. Um, their contacts are, 
you know, they can't even properly cloud their contacts because they don't work with each other, right? So found made a contact system that's one level above that works on both platforms. And so if I make a contact, right, it's a single source of truth about that phone number. And I populate it and I manage it. And if you want to see what's happening or if you want to hold my contact in your book, it updates when I update it. And so Apple's kind of doing this between Apple users and Android does it sort of between Android users. But nobody's collectively doing the whole the whole marketplace. And that's where found comes in. It's the ability to say, Hey, I want to build this single source of truth contact about myself. I want to make it publicly available. I don't want to make it publicly available. I want to lock it down. I want to open it up. Um, anytime you change information there, it changes in their book. It allows for linking to all of the social media. It allows for pictures, bios, information. Um, you can, call there you can message there you can do video calls there you can have you know thousand person meetings there and so really it becomes a visual space with a phone number as an address and really what i want to see is your first communication with me is going to my contact and negotiating contact with me and if that starts happening we'll see a lot of this stuff fall away So what happens in the case where I try to call you, you're using found, but I haven't essentially done the, 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 uh, issued the request or asked to be, uh, allowed to call you. Yeah. You receive a message saying this, this, this person protects his phone number with found, please go to found.app and enter the phone number and then negotiate contact. Okay. And then what about things where I'm, um, you know, I, I'm, uh, basically like a doctor's office or something like that, trying to reach out to me through an automated system to book uh, an appointment. What happens in that scenario? Yeah. So, you know, my, my doctor's office is actually in my contacts and, and that's one of the things you get to sync your contacts. The doctor office gets to sync their contacts or put their contacts in and you're creating trusted networks. Right. And that's really important. And, and so a doctor's office would, would, would have to like, um, you know, there's ways for them to protect themselves and to say, Hey, we'll only accept calls from people that are on our contact book. So you've actually got to be a customer customer of ours to call. Um, and then, then, you know, reaching out to the consumer, the individual consumer, um, you know, how, how is he protecting himself? And so if he's protecting himself with found and a doctor's office contacts him, they're going to go through the same scenario that they went through, you know, that we just talked about. If they send me an SMS text, they're going to get a text back telling them to go to found and to negotiate communication with me. And then they go to found and do it. And then they're up and running. Right. And then they don't have to worry about it again. And I don't have to worry about it again. So it protects both the incoming phone calls as well as potentially incoming SMSs. Is that right? Yes. SMS is a little trickier because of the need for impromptu. Um, Right. But you know, you have to manage that. That's, that's that fine line between privacy and accessibility. It's hard to, hard to manage. What are some of the, like, I guess, technical mechanisms behind making this thing work? Yeah, I think that, you know, as we started out, it's, it's, it's the, like the phone system is archaic. I mean, it's beyond obsolete. I would, I would, cons- I would consider it broken. Um, and, and until we figure out a way to address that, um, to kind of put something in front of, you know, phone numbers, which I believe is, is the contact, right? I think contacts are also broken. Um, it's like, if I want to make contact, I should look that person up, negotiate something ahead of time and then make contact, um, a lot of people let stuff go through to voicemail or this and that. I just think it's a much better, better way. It's, it's definitely a change in consumer behavior and a shift. And so, you know, we're going to push into that shift as much as we can and, and see what happens. It's a way to solve it. Um, it's just whether or not it's, you know, the way it's going to get solved or, 
um, a critical mass, like it gains critical mass that so many people use it that it's, you know, a true, true value. Yeah, I mean, similar systems, I've seen similar systems on in email, essentially, where you can, uh, you, you, you email somebody, you get a bounce back saying that you need to kind of verify the identity or, you know, you reach out through a third party system to validate who you are and so forth and that you have a legitimate reason. So I think, you know, from um, sort of just like a high level understanding of how this could work, there are sort of these analogous systems out there that have gained traction on other types of protocols. Are you are you saying there is, or you're asking me if I know of some? Oh, no, I was just saying that, drawing the analogy, there, I have seen these work on in, in the world of email, which is also another you know problem area uh, that people are well aware of. And even email is not as old as the phone system. So the phone system comes carries with it its whole uh, other weight of, uh, uh, you know, sort of archaic technology. Yeah, I think I think that's right. And I think that, that that's why we see uh, the contact card as as a key focus in, in, in solving this, right? There has to be uh, some kind of inter, intermediary to, to, to mitigate these kind of problems. And, and, and I believe that that's the contact card. I'm going to manage my contact card. I'm going to manage who can get through to me. Um, I'm going to manage what they can see. So on found, the contact card, you can manage both the visibility of it and the usability of it. And so, you know, I can set up a telephone number that when you, when you go to look at it and found it's, it's just a picture of me with like a request. And so you look at it and you go, okay, that's, that is Dave, that's the guy. And now I'll, now I'll request. And I receive a request and I can like grant you what we call community, which is the ability to put my contact in your book. And with that, I've set some kind of level of contact that you can, you can make to me. What's nice and found is I can take that contact card back from you and you don't have the ability to hold my card anymore and you can't call me anymore. And so that's a very powerful way to um, kind of corral this issue and start creating, you know, a newer, better way to actually make contact and that's kind of a pun to make a contact but um it it's 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 working and and like i use it now and um it has cut back on on you know the junk that i get but i'm also you know i'm a i'm an outward facing guy in this company right i'm looking for people to contact me um so i don't want to you know lock everything down and make it impossible to get to me but ultimately, if somebody really, really wants to get to me, they will go to the found card and they'll get evaluated. At that point, I see who they are, right? And I think the key here is, is creating a system where we can know who's calling. And if you know how, like, caller ID works, um, caller ID doesn't really allow you to know who's calling. If I spoof your phone number and I call somebody with it, right? That phone number comes through the system, gets dipped and picks up your caller ID and sends it to that person. And so as soon as I spoof your number, I've actually fooled the whole public switch telephone network and caller ID. It's very easy to do. You can, I mean, it takes minutes. So if I was a scammer, you know, went to, you know, call you or text you, I see that you're using found and then I go and I, I submit something to on found to say that I want to be able to contact you in that case. Well, one, there's like a lot of extra effort to do that. So it might not even be worth the ROI at that point, because if everybody was using this, I'm adding a ton of friction. I can't send out you know millions of these messages every day because I'm going to have to go and, and essentially do this process. But is there anything in place that prevents me from, essentially lying about why I need to contact you or is that down to the individual that's using found to essentially gatekeep that? And even if someone does get through, then you can, you know, delete that person from being a trusted contact and they can't contact you afterwards. Yeah. I mean, I, I so I think LinkedIn's a really cool example, right? Like, um, you know, when I first started using LinkedIn, I was, was happy if somebody wanted to connect, I'd, I'd accept them all. Right. <laughs> 
Um, and then after a while you realize that, Hey, once you accept them, they're just kind of messaging you and you're kind of inviting yourself to, to spam. And so at LinkedIn, if you accept everybody, well, then you're kind of back susceptible to spam. And so the idea is, is that, you know, when somebody reaches out to you, you, you look at them and you say, you know, what is this guy doing? What, what, what field is he in? Who, who, who is he? Right. And so if it's like a, you know, I'll make the LinkedIn example, a LinkedIn account that doesn't really have good information, doesn't have a picture, you know, and they're asking to, you know, it's like, well, what possible business could you, you know, be doing, right? Like, I don't, I don't, I don't want to accept you. And so it's true. The same with found. Um, somebody that wants to be accepted is going to be putting through really, really good information. And so if you saw my contact card on found, you would see a blue check found allows me to upload one of 4,000 different IDs worldwide and get a blue check. The blue check lets you know that I actually have a government issued ID that has that name on it. And I am who it, who it says I am. And not only that, that's part of the pass and the call. So you can like set on the other side. Uh, I only want to be contacted by, you know, males or females or any of the data that's found in a driver's license over the age of 18 and between the age of 35 and 45. Um, and that's sort of the beauty of found the idea is to know your caller and to know like they have an ID, um, to know the information on that ID in like a triggering fashion. It's like you, they're, they're not receiving, you know, Oh, he's 38. Right. It's just, it fell within your, your, your guidelines. Right. Um, and then when you start thinking about that value in a contact card, the, about the ability to put a true blue check, you know, an, a true ID, right. Um, you know, we have other, other features like document signing, um, and things where like, Hey, I, I want you to sign this document, but you've actually got to have an ID to do it. Right. You've got to have a blue check. I got to know you're the person that's signing it. Um, and, and I see a real future in that. And so it kind of, you know, blocks more than what we can block now contains that, but it also opens up a new field which is how well do you know your caller and on found you could know your caller really, really well. Yeah. You're, you're essentially a tying like a verified identity to the phone number so that I just, I don't get just a, a phone number or even something like a caller ID that's easy to spoof. I get potentially identifiable information about that person. And it sounds like I can control like what level of detail or what types of people can contact me based on whatever my requirements are. Yeah. So instead of getting caller ID information, you actually get the guy's full contact. And, and if he's done a, you know, piss poor job of filling that out, then you just, you don't act on it. Um, but I think it gives a prospector the ability to pull call in a favorable way, right? Like a lot of people reach out to me on LinkedIn and I don't find it bad because I'm actually looking for a way to make contact to that type of person and they're reaching out to me. And so I don't want to block them. I want to know they're trying and then I want to follow up with them and maybe, maybe I'm accepting them and calling them right back. Right. And so there's the, kind of blocking and then there's kind of the higher sense of knowledge of who's actually trying to trying to make contact. And then looking ahead to the future, do you think that there's some time in in the next, you know, 5 to 10 years or foreseeable future where we'll actually rethink fundamentally how like the protocols behind, you know, phone calls and SMS and things like that because you know, we basically have to build layers on top of these things to to secure them. Something like found, but they're they're inherently problematic systems because of the the history there. They weren't designed to be essentially secure. They're designed to be these like you know public systems that anybody can use. And we live in a much different world now. So, do you think that the, that's something that will change? I do. 
Yeah. So there's there's a change going on, and, and you'll see uh, my company's on the forefront of it. Um, 16 years ago, I started a carrier called HD Carrier, and um, we were we were big in high definition. We created the first high definition audio conferencing bridges. Um, and now, like everything, Zoom is in high definition. Teams is in high definition. Google Meets in 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 high definition. But they're not high definition on the public switch telephone network. That's all standard definition. So HD carrier is the first like high definition carrier that has three of the largest carriers in the United States at the closest aggregate point. And why that's important is, is that's the new style of communication. Um, that's the way that AT&T, T-Mobile and Verizon are going to be hooking with people in the future. When you make a call from, like, let's say an AT&T phone and it's on HD, like I'm talking about, and it's going to a found phone, it is the quickest, clearest shot from that AT&T handset to the found handset. It doesn't go over the regular public switch telephone network. It's handled a different way, right? And it gets its stir shaken. It's from one end to the end, you know, it's much, much easier to identify that call. Um, the call's more agile. It's more routable. Um, it's much higher quality. And so, you know, we're, we're very excited about this, this change, right? And we think that with a high definition voice system that like takes out some of the caveats of what we have in standard definition PSDN right now. And a high quality contact card, like the type of contact card that is is found at found. Um, those two things together go a long way in solving a lot of the problems that we have today. And so I'm very hopeful, right, that in the future these things come in at a at a at a faster pace. Uh, like I said, I started this company 16 years ago on the promise of HD voice. And it's just now in 2024 that we're realizing the benefits of all of the work that we've done with those companies. And we're still in lab in part in like receiving these calls and sending these calls. But um, yes, it's going to get much better. <laughs> and why does it take so long? Is it just the nature of you know navigating the the carrier ecosystem, or is it that the technology wasn't necessarily ready when you started this, and it took a while for the world to sort of catch up from a technical perspective? Yeah, so it's 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 market power, um, I think, in in part, right? The if like when you look at the contacts, it's it's simple. Um, contacts are no good because Android and Apple don't work well together, right? Um, caller, like trying to get ca enhanced caller ID was a big, huge battle because T-Mobile wanted to do it their way. Verizon wanted to do it their way. AT&T wanted to do it their way. They all did it. You had to work with a company in between you and those carriers. And there was three different ones. And then you had to get an aggregator that aggregated the three companies that those guys put in charge of the enhanced caller ID and I still haven't received a call with enhanced caller ID after, you know, it's been years. And so it's just difficult for those guys that really push for market power to work together. And so um, that's why like, I'm super excited about being the closest aggregator of HD voice on those three, three networks, because I think they are going to have problems exchanging with each other and, and aggregating for, 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 you know, other carriers and, and it's, it's a bit of a mess. Um, but that's sort of always been the case. And like in found, that's why we decided, Hey, we're going to go up one level. And if we go up one level, then we work on all devices. We work on all phones and we work with all carriers. And, and that's the starting of something, you know, that, that, that'll work, right? These other ones kind of started off in a bad situation because they, they, they're in these, you know, market share struggles with each other. Yeah. I think the, the strategy with found makes, uh, makes a ton of sense. Uh, and you know, you speaking about some of the struggles that you had with the, um, you know, the high def approach is it's similar to some of the struggles that we had when we were working on rich communication services at Google, 
across, you know, some of the carriers and it, it, it is, it takes a long time. It's uh, um, even, even with the Google's uh, sort of, you know, weight that it can enforce on, on um, its will on people. It, it takes incredible amount of time to try to make something like that happen and get everybody to agree on it. And even if it's better for the ecosystem. Yeah. I think, I think, you know, uh, your working at Google is probably a very relevant experience, right? You can see how, um, technology wise, things are very, very possible. It would be easy to do, but it's like this carrier does it this way. That one does it this way. You know, um, these, these things that are, you know, they're backwards. Um, and I, 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 we can't leave it up to the three carriers or the two operating systems to, to fix it. I think it has to be done outside of there and obviously in cooperation with them, but, um, yeah, it's gotta be, be done on another level. Yeah, absolutely. So as we start to wrap up, uh, Dave, is there anything else you'd like to share? Well, um, I would encourage people, uh, you know, that are, that are interested in this privacy and working on, on privacy and or need of privacy to, uh, give, give found a try. It's, it's a free product. Um, it installs very easy, but the goal here would be to, you know, solicit feedback, um, solicit improvement, you know, what could we do to make it better? Where are we missing the mark kind of a thing? Um, we are out to solve this. We are out to, you know, quash a lot of these problems that, that we see and, and, and they are rampant and they are growing at an incredible rate. You know, the SMS and, and the voice stuff because of all of the computerization and AI and, and, um, it's just a huge volume game and it, 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 everything's commoditized and the costs are down. And so, um, we're really looking for a way to bring power back to the consumer put me in charge of my communications instead of my carrier or instead of my, my operating system on my phone or where my device came from, you know, put that power in the, in the, in the hands of the consumer and do it through something that they're familiar with a contact card. Um, but I would, I would love it if, if, if anybody listened to this would, would download and give us feedback. We're very open and um, you know, we'd love to hear it. Awesome. Yeah. And we can, we'll link uh, everything in the show notes. And I think you're working on something that's uh, very ambitious. And if it worked out, would make the world a much you know safer and less annoying place to, to, to have a, a phone in your pocket and hopefully prevent less people from suffering from some of these, uh, you know, scammers and so on. Yeah. And, and the good news is, is, you know, we, we feel we've gone a long way to solve this and, and that it's available. Um, and, and, you know, we'll continue to work on it. So, um, there is, there is solutions. It's going to take a little bit of change in human behavior, which is never really easy, right? We're pretty accustomed to what we have, but I think if we can make that shift, we could actually make major improvements in this problem. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Dave, thanks so much for being here and cheers. Yes. Thank you. 